Wow, the end of the world. There's no pressure there. Um, well, thank you very much for having me, Joel. That was a great introduction. And thank you, National Geographic and the Fulbright Program for allowing me to be here on this stage. Um, for the past, we'll get to it. About eight years, I've been traveling to Japan. It's one of the most beautiful countries I've ever been to, filled with modern juxtapositions between culture and, and technology and some old world places and beautiful landscapes and fast-paced cities, and I'm always searching for new angles to capture my favorite country and beautiful, beautiful new technological rooms. It's incredible with the old culture. And But I didn't just go to take pictures of, of culture, of pretty places, of beautiful religions. I came to meet and understand what happened in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Because at the heart of it, there's a very real question of, if we don't listen to what happened in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, could the world end? Uh, could it happen again? And that's something I think about often, and it's, but, but why, why me? I started this book, The Nuclear Family, which became a documentary, became a lot of things, a Facebook page that you can go ahead and like. Um, <laughs> no big deal, it's fine. Um, yeah, I started this, but because in about 2010, I was graduating college and a book came out that I don't even need to give any more oxygen to, but it wasn't true. Uh, it was actually optioned by James Cameron to be a movie. And the true part about it was that there was a man who survived Hiroshima and then he went home and was telling everybody what he went through and then he survived Nagasaki. He, he survived both atomic bombs. But a man on that plane, a, a man that the author interviewed said he was on an airplane he wasn't on and there wasn't a true voice of the American perspective in the book. So I was frustrated enough to start writing this book and to, talk, to start telling a story that I knew was true. Um, my grandfather, Jacob Beezer, was the only man on both of the airplanes that dropped the atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. He was the only one on both of the planes. There were people on both missions, but he was there in, the, in that seat um, in both her, uh, the Enola Gay and it was called Boxcar over in Nagasaki and he saw both mushroom clouds from above. And just coincidentally, my other grandfather was friends with somebody underneath the mushroom cloud in Hiroshima. And when I was a child, I actually met her. Um, we don't show her face or say her name, but uh, because I went in 2011, actually, I went to meet her family and I asked if they would work with me to send this mission, to send this message. I thought it was so strange that we could be connected from both sides of the atomic bomb, that we had to do something about this. It was only natural to me to want to do something. And she said, no, we can be your friends, and we're happy to know you. And admittedly, it's been hard to keep in touch over the years, but we can't work with you. You have to meet actual living atomic bomb survivors if you want to understand what happened. So that enter Keiko Ogura. She was eight years old when she survived Hiroshima. And the Hiroshima Peace Memorial and Museum actually connected us. She speaks English fluently. Um, and she agreed, made it her mission to introduce me to survivors who couldn't speak English so that I could understand what they went through. And eventually, they would ask me to tell their stories to the world. There was, if you've ever heard of the story of Sadako and the Thousand Paper Cranes, she was two years old when the bomb dropped, and when she was 12 years old, she, she got leukemia. And the Japanese legend says if you fold a thousand cranes, then you can receive a wish, and she was on her way to her second thousand when she passed away. And her classmates raised money and they erected the statue for her and for all the children who were killed by the atomic bomb. And I actually met her nephew, Yuji, in 2011. And when we met, he ran into the back room and he pulled out a little tiny plastic box. And he opened the box and inside was a tiny paper crane and a little triangle. And he said that that was the last crane his aunt folded and the triangle was the crane she didn't finish. And he put the crane in my hand and said in 2010, I met the grandson of President Truman, the president who dropped the atomic bomb, and I asked him if he would work with me, and I'm asking you the same question. Will you, will you work with us to send a message of peace? And I was 23 years old, and I, I, I had no idea what to do, so I was like, sure, absolutely, I'll work with you to send a message of peace. Um, and I didn't really know what we could do or what would make a difference, but the next year, we were back in Japan. The, uh, Clifton Daniel, he's the, um, the son of Truman's only daughter, was the first member of the Truman family to come to Japan. And it was an incredible deal that he was there and to see all the survivors. And pretty much everywhere we were going, I kind of felt like Forrest Gump 
in the background of these historical moments, and it was just incredible to be there, and I got to witness all these things, and nothing, I did not have to get up on stage and talk or do these things right now that make me so nervous, it's fine. But, um, oh, thank you, I made this podium myself. Um, so, you know, so we were there, and we were asked to tell the stories of the survivors who, who, who spoke to us, and we came and we paid our respects the Hiroshima Memorial and the anniversary where they light 80,000 lanterns to commemorate the 80,000 souls that were lost that day and they float them down the Motoyasu River, which is a sight to behold in itself. But I've been lucky enough to see it multiple years now. And we went to Nagasaki where we went to the Remembrance Hall, which is dedicated to the survivors. And in that glass pillar at the very end is etched with all the names of the victims. And it, every time somebody passes away, even now, they'll add the name to the list because they're considered them victims of the atomic bomb, even 70 plus years later. But we were there. We were chased by paparazzi, by Japanese media, which when they were staring directly at me, when I was literally looking up and this camera was staring in my face, the only thing I could think about was, why am I here? Why am I doing this? Why me? I'm just some kid's grandson. I didn't have any brilliant mind. I didn't have any thoughts to add that they, these people, these thinkers, these people who studied this issue for so long were doing. What could I possibly do? And I didn't really have an answer until later that day when we were at school and we were talking to children. And I realized that these kids, they might get lucky enough to meet a survivor, but their kids won't and their children thereafter won't have the messages of, the, of what happens when atomic bombs are dropped. And I realized that this isn't for us, it's for the next generation, because that's what we can do. There are, I mean, I look around and there are people documenting atomic bomb survivor testimony. There aren't a ton of us. And so if we don't do this, if some people just don't care enough about it to go after these stories, they're gonna get lost. And I think we're starting to see what happens when we forget history. The people are forgetting the Holocaust and well, there's a bit of a problem right now with hate crimes, if we haven't noticed. But I'm really worried that when you forget something like this, you don't get to undo that mistake. We can, undo, we can unlearn racism, we can combat that, and it's something that we can live through and survive. But if we drop another nuclear bomb, if we forget what happens when those bombs are dropped, then it's not just military cities. Hiroshima and Nagasaki were home to thousands of children. So this isn't something that you can just write off and, and say, well, this is one thing, it's another. It's, it's, it's a very real thing that could happen again. And it's, we need better stories surrounding the topic that we can engage with, that we can do something with, because they just aren't there. And nobody's really, well, people are making them, but it's always a hard sell. Nuclear stories are a hard sell. And yet it's interesting that that world could very well end and everyone's like, oh, well, nuclear stories don't do well. Like, yeah, well, the world's not gonna do well if we don't tell these stories, so. <laughs> pick and choose. So that's when I got involved with the organization that was really driving all of these introductions and meetings. It was Hibakusha Stories. Hibakusha are the atomic bomb survivors in Japanese. And Hibakusha Stories have been working to bring survivors to New York schools and to bring us all together so that we can not just talk about the dangers of nuclear war, but we talk about what we can do. And we can talk about reconciliation and how to have better relationships. And it's not passive, like, way I'm just talking to all of you and you're just sitting there listening. It's engaging. They have activities where we open it up to the audience and we ask you to do things and we tell you to think about things and we express, we have something called open sentences where you, you give everyone and split up into partners and you do three sentences and it's not a conversation, it's a listening exercise so everyone in the room can really engage with what they've just heard so it's not passive, it's incredible. Um, and we've gone all to all 40,000 students, I think, have, have heard the witness of the atomic bomb survivors but we need to do more and their survivors, like I said, are dwindling so these kinds of activities are just, are, are gonna be a thing of the past if we can't do something about it right now. And luckily, I've been working with something, someone called Peace Boat, which has taken these testimonies around the world. And we've gone places like Singapore, where as, if you're not familiar with World War II history, the um, audience in Singapore might not be super sympathetic to a Japanese victim, telling them how their experience was terrible because they were victimized by the Japanese too. But so in these very tense confrontations, they were, she was called out. She was, you know, why, why should I care? Because you guys did awful things to us. And she says, this isn't about what happened, and yes, it is, and we are sorry, but she's an American citizen now. And so she's saying, well, I've overcome a lot of stuff too, and this isn't about, you know, this is about what could happen. And so we have to work together because these are the things we have to overcome, otherwise they're gonna repeat. And in Asia, the World War II history is very much alive, and there's a lot of tensions 
and they're all still due to what happened 70 plus years ago. Even though we feel like it's over and it's something that's in our history, it's very active over there. And it's all connected, like Miyata-san and I, and all of us were in Auschwitz together, where they got to meet a survivor, and that, that talk about intersectionality, it was really um, incredible to see these two people share this human suffering in a way that it wasn't political, it was just looking at you from one person to another, and we were walking in, in Birkenau, the death camp, and he had this realization, he goes, huh, Jewish scientists escaped Nazis, helped America build an atomic bomb, and it was dropped on me. Everything is connected. And we became as close as family. They are like my grandparents. And, and I was looking through all of my photos. I was trying to think of what's the one that could really signify family. And I couldn't escape this one. Uh, <laughs> this was, I mean, I'm looking through oh, I have so many photos on my phone. And we've been all over. We, I got to visit Miyata-san in his hometown in Obama Onsen. And I'm pretty sure very few members of the crew's family can say they've gone out drinking with atomic bomb survivors um, and done karaoke and saying Guantanamo in the streets at 2 a.m. It's fine, this is what we do. Because this isn't just about their testimonies, it was about getting to know them and the people that they were. They're not just survivors, they're, they're people. They're awesome people. They're, they're all with their own characters, their own stories, and that's the thing that I've been lucky enough to get to know the most. And they've introduced me to the depths of Nagasaki, for example, which many people don't know has a very deep history with Christianity, with hidden, hidden Christianity, where the Christians were persecuted. And when the atomic bomb was dropped, it was dropped directly on top of a cathedral and had just finished mass. And there's the bell tower um, from the original, uh, from the original uh, cathedral that, that's still exactly where it was. And it's, tremendously huge, so it just shows you the, the power of the blast, and there's like the Bomb Mary, for example, which is a miracle relic. Um, the eyes burned out, but the wooden statue didn't, and so it's um, miraculous that it survived from the Urakami Cathedral, and it's still there now. And Ogura-san, she took me to exactly the point where she was when the bomb was dropped, when she was eight years old. She came up to that hill, and she pointed out, and she could show me that basically you could see the sea. All of those buildings that you can see were flattened, and it was just, it looked like you could walk to the water, but it smiles. And I was lucky enough to be at the intimate moment for my, my first time to see the Enola Gay was Yamamoto-san second, the first time being 70 years ago when it attacked him. And he is just an amazing guy, and he really wanted, he let me come, and, I, and not just that, but we we're friends. And it's just the, the fact that these people let me into their lives, knowing that my grandfather did this to them and caused trauma that, well, not just him, but the whole, it was tr completely traumatic for, 70, for seven decades, and yet here they were in this, just like it was nothing, being, being my friend. And I think, yes, we can like listen to the stories and we can learn about the dangers of nuclear war, but I think there's such an amazing fact that, first of all, the Fulbright program is the United States government, the State Department. They had an official sanction to send the grandson of the person that was on both of the planes to go and officially meet atomic bomb survivors in a government capacity. And that's not touted enough. I think that in itself was incredible that they could go through that effort just to have these two stories come together. They really weren't sure it could happen and it could have been really sensitive. But they just had the faith in me and the faith in this mission and it's just been remarkable to see what relationships have come out of it. And this was probably the most chilling encounter for me. She was 13 years old when she survived the blast and she was working in the, it was kind of like a call center but in a bomb shelter. So they were listening for airplanes and air raid warnings and she would be the one to release the air raid warning to the broadcasters. So they get a plane, they get a warning. There's a plane directly over Yamaguchi, for example. She calls the NHK and says, you know, release the air raid warning. So she actually was on like, had the paper in her hand, was rushing to get to the person to call to release the air raid warning for the Enola Gay when the bomb dropped. And when she came to, she came, she woke up like two minutes after most people report like it was dark by the time they woke up, but she still, nothing had caught fire when she woke up. And she scrambled, tried to find a call box and tried to find something that was working and she found one and reached out to Fukuyama and said that Hiroshima was destroyed, a new type of bomb, a new type of bomb destroyed Hiroshima. And that was actually the initial report that, the, that Hiroshima had been attacked. And we're losing these voices. Like Taniguchi-san, he's holding a picture of himself. You might have seen that photo before. It's in the textbooks. It's um, his 
in, to show you the, just the brutal injuries that you can experience in the atomic bomb blast. He was on his stomach for a year and nine months in recovery, and he survived. And he, you, I mean, it, it hit him, you, he could cough the wrong way and break, and break a rib. He was so sensitive, and, and he would still fly 10 hours from Tokyo to, or I think it was 12 hours, to get to New York and talk at the UN, and not realizing that he can't lean back in the chair. So he had to like sit up for that entire flight. It's exhausting for him to even travel. And, um, and he recently, this was the last photo I took of him. We were just saying hello, we were just visiting, and um, we were received, a few, I think a few months ago, we received word that he had passed away. Um, and one of the stories that I think he, I, you know, he is a very powerful person. He's a very powerful speaker. Everyone knows him as this historic figure, if you will. But he was really funny, and he was really just a chill guy. And he was, uh, he always had a cigarette in his hand. And um, I asked him about that. Someone said, you should, you should, I don't even smoke cigarettes. And he's like, you should, someone should, you should ask him to smoke with you. I was like, okay, sure. So I asked him, and he's like, oh, I'm sorry, there's nowhere in the museum premises that we can smoke, so we have to go somewhere else, and it's too much. So I was like, okay, that's totally fine. I don't, I didn't really want to anyway. But um, <laughs> uh, he told me, he says, when I was 19, I said, why do you smoke? Because it's probably not good for you. And he says, well, when I was 19, I was lying on my stomach, and I pretty much had a, I had a fever for four days straight. And on the fourth day, I pretty much thought I was a goner. I thought I was going to die. And I smelled a cigarette, and a soldier must have been outside smoking nearby. And he asked him for one, and he gave him the cigarette, just like took pity on him, gave him a cigarette, and his fever broke. And so he said, I've been smoking two packs a day every day for the rest of my life. <laughs> and his son is a doctor. And he was like, no, I don't think you should do that. And he was, no, it's fine. I'm not going to die until the end of the nuclear weapons age. So uh, I, I, I don't know. I mean, you know, uh, he did pass after the treaty passed. So I don't know if there was anything to do with that. Like, I really, really believe he was holding on for a really long time. He got pneumonia when he was 86 years old. He did have to cut back smoking. He cut back to one pack a day. Um, <laughs> and yet, but he, he held on. And he sent, his message, he sent his message wherever he goes and wherever he went. And he believed that we had to listen because it would be forgotten. And so do the people that have been working in the international campaign. Every single person you see in this picture is working nonstop around the clock just to make nuclear weapons illegal. And while well, the treaty passed with 122 countries in the United Nations voting to adopt it, but um, it didn't just pass. It takes a lot of hard work and a lot of lobbying and a lot of explaining in first committee side events in uh, conferences around the world that people are putting in themselves to go to. No one just pays you to go. There's not a lot of money in nuclear disarmament. Um, there really isn't, and that we, I think there would be more um, people involved if, if who could get paid to do this. But you, you know, you really um, get because of that. You really get the most passionate people on the issue, the people who really can afford to take their time and to talk about this. And it passed. And I think it's kind of strange to, if you think about it. Like in a hundred years from now, or two hundred years from now, if we actually get rid of nuclear weapons, it'll be because of this moment. This moment when the treaty passed and Setsuko Thurlow had just addressed the United Nations and she basically showed that it was her words, the human words, the human story that happens when the atomic bombs are dropped is what's driving people to, to make them illegal. And it, it's different than it was like with the MPT. It's not, um, it's not a political thing. This isn't about what, con what countries can do or who gets the power. It's about what happens to li literally all of us when the nuclear war is waged. And it, it's like if India and Pakistan wage a nuclear war, we're affected. And we can't even, so that's not fair. And so that's not a political argument. That's a human thing. That's a human right. So that's what's really changed the movement. And when she said, and I think this moment always sticks with me. She said that 80, every single person that was killed by the atomic bomb, every single person in that fire had a name and was loved by somebody. And it really hit you head home. And that all of us, we all have names. And we all are all loved by somebody, hopefully. And yet, we just put numbers. And we say, like, oh, well, it's a million casualties. Like, you can say a million casualties really quickly and easily. And it, really doesn't really like weigh much on you. But if you look at the name of all million people, then you couldn't let such a thing happen. So, you know, 
bringing it back to the, to the human story is really the crux of why disarmament has had any progress. And now we have a treaty. And it's not just a, a strange thing. We don't, we don't so just talk about ridding the world of nuclear weapons as if it's just like ideology. We actually have steps, and there's laws, and it's legal. And that in itself is amazing. And if it doesn't actually make nuclear weapons, if we don't reduce the nuclear weapons to zero because of this treaty, it will change the stigma around them. You say biological weapons, you say landmines, you say chemical weapons, and you say um, cluster munitions, and you, immediately these are the wrong weapons in your mind. Like, oh, those, that's so illegal, like you, you can't have them, you can't use them, and if you do get them, then it's a problem and we have to start something. But for some reason, nuclear weapons are in a different category. And that might not change for us, but what we can start doing is framing it differently, and then we can teach that, and then the kids will grow up, and then that will never be legal, and they will never have the stigma of being safe or getting security or getting power because of these things. They're just toxic masculinity in a different form. And then, you know, one day I woke up, at, it was like I think some day in October, and I checked my Facebook, and everyone was saying, we won the Nobel Peace Prize, we won the Nobel Peace Prize. And I said, who's we? And then saw the news in that it was the international campaign to abolish nuclear weapons. We won the Nobel Peace Prize, and I still struggle with including myself in that because all I do is take pictures and tell and write and tell stories. And you know, I just there are people who've been in the front lines of this for decades. There are people who survived the nuclear war. There are people who spend their lives and all their money, like getting masters and PhDs and going into government and actually writing the policies. And I was just here to listen to them and talk about it and maybe tell kids. And so I just didn't really feel like, you know, that I belonged like these people. But, you know, I mean, it's, that's Beatrice in the left holding the medal. She accepted the award on behalf of ICANN. She's the executive director. And she reminded everybody in her speech that it's truly the end of nuclear weapons or the end of us. There's no in between. And right now, I think it's pretty heavy, and we can, you know, get lost in the details and also lost in the horror of what happens in nuclear war and the fact that, you know, the least controllable people on the planet own them. I mean, there's like Donald Trump, Theresa May, uh, I mean, just the two of them in itself is nuts. And then, you know, like Macron, and all these people, and there's just nine people that have all the nuclear weapons and in, in their governments, but really it's nine people that can launch the end of the world. And it's a massive problem, it's a massive thing to think about, but there's activity, there's so much happening, and there's a movement, and there's a treaty, and there's a way out. But what we need are storytellers, and what we need are, not just for the nuclear weapons issue, we have plenty of people working on this, but, and it was amazing to see John Legend, I mean, this is such a surreal thing. I mean, John Legend was performing on a, play, a piano that survived the atomic bomb with Zara Larson, singing God Only Knows, and I'm thinking to myself, why am I here? What is the point of this? How did I get here? I'm just a kid who doesn't know anything. And you all are coming in to hear me talk about restarting. <laughs> Thank you. But um, it, it's been, yeah, it's just been surreal, and I couldn't imagine why I was here. And then the only thing I can come back to is getting together and talking about it. And eventually, I got to meet the, grand, the granddaughter of that survivor who survived both atomic bombs, both Hiroshima and Nagasaki. His name was Tomo Yamaguchi. And she asks me that we send each other. She always asks what my message is, and she always tells me what her message is so that we can give them in tandem around the world. We never rarely get to be together, but we always speak it together. Um, and the one thing I'm reminded is that Stomi Yamaguchi used to say that the truth starts out as a whisper, but we have to keep telling it. The truth transcends borders, and I always add that the truth transcends walls. So if we can imagine that world without nuclear weapons, then we have to work together to achieve it. Um, and I think it's possible. And now that we have a legal way out, there's, it's not impossible anymore. It's not just an idea. We can make peace great again. Thanks.